Now we're getting started. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to have you here. Um, I'm Jennifer Weiss-Wolf, um, and uh, on behalf of uh, NYU Law's Meltzer Center for Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging, and the Brennan, uh, excuse me, the Birnbaum Women's Leadership Network, uh, we're really pleased to welcome you today, uh, especially our two organizations, Birnbaum and Meltzer Center, um, have aligned missions and um, we're most joyful partners with each other. Um, and we're really pleased to be co-hosting today's talk, Our Constitutions Helping or Hindering Equality. Uh, Women's History Month poses an especially right moment to be having this conversation, uh, the role that constitutions play around the globe in the fights for equality and for gender equity. Um, folks may know that even here at home, equality is not yet enshrined in the United States Constitution. Um, and somehow it's a matter that's still up for public debate. There were just public hearings uh, in the Senate Judiciary Committee a few weeks ago on uh, the future of the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, the protections that can be conferred by constitutions, it's not just a matter of theory or a symbolic matter, but impacts everything from the way we define rights to abortion and reproductive care, to how we address gender-based violence, employment discrimination, LGBTQ rights, among many other issues. I can't imagine two better people to be leading this conversation today. Uh, first, we are so pleased to welcome you, Professor Ruth Rubio, a professor of constitutional law at the University of Sevilla. She is on 5 p.m. Spain time right now. Um, and she's also a professor, professor in NYU Hauser's Global Law School program. Uh, her latest book, Global Gender Constitutionalism and Women's Citizenship, is the subject of today's talk. Uh, Ruth is a prol prolific writer. She's the author of over 50 scholarly articles and the author, editor, and her co-editor of 11 books. She's worked for national and international institutions and agencies, including with the UN, and with the EU, um, as well as NGOs, including the International Center for Transitional Justice. Uh, she travels the globe to prevent, present to diverse audiences and speaks five languages fluently, which is extraordinary. Um, she'll be in conversation, of course, with NYU Law's own Kenji Yoshino, the Chief Justice Earl Warren Professor of Constitutional Law and Faculty Director for the Meltzer Center, uh, I'm sure folks know that Kenji's latest book that was co-authored with David Glasgow, the director uh, of the Meltzer Center, Say the Right Thing, How to Talk About Identity, Diversity, and Justice, was just published last month by Simon & Schuster. Uh, and you can hear them, Kenji in particular, just about everywhere, uh, from NPR to MSNBC, uh, to the pages of the Los Angeles Times and Time Magazine, weighing in on all of how all of us can say the right thing, um, which I think Kenji's going to kick us off and doing in just a moment. I want to just say a really quick but uh, deeply felt thank you uh, to the shared uh, Meltzer Birnbaum team, Shirley Dang and Claire Whitman, who do all the behind the scenes heavy lifting to make these events possible. And it is a lot of behind the scenes heavy lifting. Um, so thank you, Claire and Shirley. Uh, and with that, Kenji, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jen. You know, I also want to thank the uh, Birnbaum Women's uh, Leadership Center for uh, your collaborations. Uh, it's truly really been a joy, as you said, and uh, all of our colleagues here today, but most particularly my dear friend, uh, Ruth Rubio Marin. Uh, we've been uh, forever allies and close colleagues for decades now, and it's really just such a pleasure to be in conversation with you today about your fine book. Um, uh, so your book is called, I'll start right off, Global Gender Constitutionalism and Women's Citizenship, Ruth. Uh, for those in the audience who aren't constitutional law scholars, uh, can you please explain what you mean by constitutionalism and give us a summary in broad terms of what the book is about? I, I can do that, uh, but, I, but I have to say hello to everyone and, and, and thank you for having me. It, it is such a pleasure. I was following uh, your series last year when I was visiting NYU and pretty much apartment bound other than teaching with my mask. So thank you for the amazing series and, and thank you for having me. So I think the audience uh, will be familiar with, with the term constitutional law. And, and I think we can broadly, you know, speaking agree that you know, we're talking about written constitutions as interpreted through case law and scholarly commentary. I think when, when, when I use the word constitutionalism, I, I want to imply probably more of a historical and diachronic 
uh, perspective. So how has constitutional law evolved over time, which makes particular sense, not only, but particular sense in countries like mine that haven't had one constitution, but many constitutions throughout history. So in a way, Kenji, the book, uh, what it tries to do is it tries to put together, one could say a her story of constitutionalism. Um, it's to tell the history of constitutionalism through a gender lens, um, you know, taking into account evolution of provisions, of doctrines, um, you know, it, identifying landmark cases and key constitutional moments. Uh, the question is, when we do those exercises, does it change if we if we try to, you know, bring a gender lens to the discipline? Um, and, you know, in broad terms, it tries to give an answer to this overarching question, which is, how has you know, constitutional law throughout time and across the globe uh, responded to evolving claims that women and sexual or gender minorities have been putting forward? That is, That was the, the, the question that triggered uh, this, this adventure. Beautiful. So to uh, go a little bit more deeply, um, you describe different forms uh, that gender constitutionalism can take. So the first is exclusionary gender constitutionalism. Then we have inclusive gender constitutionalism. Third, we have participatory gender constitutionalism. And finally, transformative gender constitutionalism. So I found this taxonomy extremely illuminating, and I'm sure our audience will as well. Uh, could you please describe what you mean by each of these four forms? Yes, I, I can. Um, in fact, as you probably noticed, Kenji, I play with, uh, with two, two terms. I, I, I identify these as forms. I also identify these as faces because these forms actually appear for the first time, you know, either in written provisions or through constitutional interpretation at, at a specific point in time in history. But I, I, I think the forms, the understanding of forms is actually the, the better understanding because if you talk about faces, it tends to imply that every jurisdiction somehow has to go through these phases and that's that's not true. Or that, you know, they, they appear in a stage moment and that's not true. Countries that have, you know, joined the club of constitutional democracies later may, may, may have a combination of these forms appearing at the same time. So, um, so I think uh, forms is the, is, is the better way of understanding them. The exclusionary, you know, exclusionary gender constitutionalism is, is what constitutionalism was um, at the moment it was initially um, uh, crafted. You know, if you think of the inception of constitutional law when uh, written rights-based constitutions emerge um, as a result of uh, the liberal revolutions, both, both ends of the Atlantic, what you have is, is a gender order um, that reflects or mimics the separate spheres tradition with marriage being this key institution that kind of defines really the space for women's citizenship. So the public private division um, and women, you know, as a result being really excluded from, you know, full rights. Um, so, so that is what I call gender exclusionary constitutionalism. And in fact, the US, which is, is such a precious um, example because it has stuck to the same constitution. So you can actually see how, you know, judges engage with a constitution to confront women's claims, whether it be to, you know, vote or to, uh, to be a bartender or to be a, a, a member of the jury and being told, no, 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 you don't belong to the public sphere. This is just not your place. Yes, you are a US citizen, but, you know, a different kind of US citizen. So that's what I call exclusionary. Um, and then really what, what you find are different forms of what could, one could understand as egalitarian forms of um, uh, constitutionalism. And, and here is where I distinguish inclusive, participatory and transformative. Let me briefly try to explain what, what I mean. So inclusive constitutionalism, I think uh, is, is, is rather straightforward is, you know, if you've been excluded from, full and equal rights, now you're you know, suddenly uh, included. Uh, you are considered an equal member of our community. And what you find not in the US, we, we heard in the introduction that the ERA has still not succeeded, but in most constitutions around the world, there's a moment, the, these, these sex equality provisions appear for the first time in constitutional law in the interwar period. 
um, and they and and you know and they start banning sex-based discrimination. Uh, we know that in the U.S. this happens jurisprudentially, but the idea is that at least women are considered you know full and equal members in terms of holding rights. Now, what I identify in the book, and this really resonates um, maybe less in the U.S. because the U.S. has not yet accept, uh, endorsed gender quotas. But what we do identify is in the 90s, you know, a shift both in, um, in constitutional law and constitution making and also in the gender equality narrative. A shift that um, tries to convey the idea that holding rights is not enough, that you actually want to be a decision maker. You don't want just to play a game. You actually want to define the rules of the game. So when you look at uh, some of uh, women's transnational um, mobilization, the Beijing Platform for Action, the idea of equal participation becomes really, um, uh, comes really to the fore. What you see is the spread of gender quotas, trying to you know, uh, give women a seat at the table. You also see some increase in women's attempt to have an impact when it comes to designing and drafting new constitutions together with a broader movement of greater civil society involvement in constitution making. And that I think strikes, you know, kind of a before and after, because, you know, one, one could say you have old con gender constitutionalism and new gender constitutionalism after that, because the joining of women in constitution making broadens the agenda of, of you know, what it is, of, of what constitutions should contain, but also significantly um, these provisions that try to enhance in, uh, women's representation are also specifically enshrined in constitutions. So I call this, this the participatory modality, if you want. And then very much linked to that, in, in a way a result of that, and what I would call the new millennium gender constitutionalism, is the transformative uh, constitutional modality. And um, what this is about is, you know, the other side of the equation. In order to disestablish this foundational gender order, you need to challenge, uh, you know, women's absence or lack of participation in the public sphere. But of course, you, you also need to unsettle the private sphere, right? So what you see is um, a move towards the democratization of the private sphere, the full challenge of gender roles within it, and with it, you know, an expanded constitutional agenda ranging from egalitarian marriage, so same-sex marriage, violence against women as being, you know, a subject of constitutional concern, greater affirmation of sexual and reproductive rights, and care uh, being uh, foregrounded, including, you know, the new, new conceptions of masculinity and fatherhood. That is all happening as we speak, together, of course, with, you know, with the challenge of the, of the gender binary and gender identity itself, which, you know, um, is, comes in a way as a result of that evolution. Terrific. So given that we're hosting this event in the United States, and with apologies for my parochialism here, which form <laughs> of gender constitutionalism do you think best describes the United States? Well, unfortunately, I think because you have such an old constitution, um, you know, the U.S. is kind of stuck in the in the first form, in the in the egalitarian form, in, uh, in the inclusive form of egalitarian constitutionalism. Um, as a result, as you know, of um, you know constitutional interpretation. But um, maybe I can I can um, use this this uh, question to introduce a certain nuance. Um, which is that although I have spoken of this form of inclusive constitutionalism, which is equal rights constitutionalism, there's actually two modalities that I have identified in the book. Um, the US model is a model of inclusive constitutionalism that I have called assimilationist workerism. It's very much focused in, on combating stere gender stereotypes. Um, and you know, it, it 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 doesn't try to accommodate you know women's specific needs because just mentioning that women have specific needs seems to entail an essentialist uh, notion of womanhood and entrench gender uh, stereotypes. So it's it's very much focused on combating uh, stereotypes. Europe developed a different form of inclusive constitutionalism 
which I have called maternalist accommodationist, uh, which um, says, well, you know, well, first of all, unlike the US, you know, we, we, we believe in substantive notions of equality or equity. So this notion of equal opportunities and not just equal rights. And that requires accommodating women's specific needs. Um, so promotional measures are okay, but also, you know, motherhood, uh, protective measures, parental leaves of sorts, all of that is seen as fulfilling this substantive notion of equality. Now, of course, you can see the, 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 the promising, but also the problematic aspect of that vision, which is one that doesn't turn a blind eye to reproduction um, and, and, and says, oh, yeah, that's, that's your private concern. That's none of our business. But on the other hand, does entrench gender role by embracing this, this broad notion of gender that's not just you know, biological needs, but functional, um, functional performances of gender that are accommodated thereby. This is why, this is why I think uh, without transformative constitutionalism that takes care into account but degenders care, you know, we can't quite, you know, uh, you know, reach um, you know, full equality and equity. So we're kind of both stuck, but but um, I would say the US is significantly more stuck because you know we have had opportunities in Europe. Although Europe is not leading the way, as I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll be able to discuss, but we have had opportunities to, to amend constitutions, to include participatory dimensions, and there's also promising uh, interpretations along the transformative dimension. Good. So it might be not just the kind of uh, sort of longevity of our constitution, but also the difficulty that uh, Article 5 has with regard to the amendment procedures for the constitution that make it Sort of mired in this first form of inclusion. Um, so uh, thank you for that. So another huge concept in your book is the concept of the gender order. Um, so this is foundational in your work. Uh, could you please tell us what you mean by gender order? Yeah, you know, in a way, I think the best, well, I, I think I kind of mentioned it. It's this idea that there's a, you know, an understanding of gender relations and of the structural role that 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 understanding plays in the organization of society. And the idea of the book, I like to think of the religious analogy. It's almost like what I'm trying to say is, listen, you know, there was an established gender order and the whole fight and the whole struggle has been one about disestablishing that and challenging that as if, you know, there had been a gender, an established religion and then what you're trying to do is disestablish that. Um, I think I think that is really telling because um, you know in many ways we take you know we often take the post World War II constitutional moment as one that epitomizes you know um, egalitarian constitutionalism, the banning of sex based discrimination that you see not only in constitutions that are drafted after the Second World War but also um, in, in human rights treaties, you of course see you know, equal suffrage for women, even in the laggards, including France, which only granted it in 1944. So you, you see that and you tend to identify that as a, a, a foundational moment uh, of a new gender order, but in fact, it coincided with the heyday of the breadwinner family model. So it only happens, starts happening much later, and I claim it's still a very much ongoing process. But the gender order, I think, is, is best captured if you think of it in, with the analogy of an established religion uh, that you know we're trying to um, uh, that we're trying to fight and overcome in order to come to a more meaningful um, notion of equal citizenship for women and gender and sexual minorities. Right. And then perhaps to carry the analogy, we might think about the free exercise, you know, uh, of religion as being a good analog for the free exercise of gender in a more liberatory vein. Um, so I want to turn now to abortion constitutionalism, uh, which you talk about uh, at several junctures in the book. And this is obviously an immensely sort of hot topic in the United States now. You really refer to two particular moments and contrast them. So mm -hmm. one is you explicitly make reference to the United States in the 1970s as an example of progressive abortion constitutionalism. And the second is to more contemporary debates where really the opposite is true in the United States, 
But you note that even as the US appears to be trending backwards, progressive interpretations are being crafted in Europe and Latin America. So can I draw you out on this? Why, why is this happening? What are we to make of this? You know, this is fascinating to me because it, it made, it was one of these aha moments in the book. Um, what you see in the 70s is that, you know, most gender constitutionalism is still, as I said, focused on the public sphere. Um, so women have conquered suffrage, but now they want, you know, equality, employment equality and social security equality. Um, but there's this striking thing called Roe v. Wade, which is really unique because it, it, it you know, it, 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 it is the first, I think, the first clear expression of the enshrining of something that would have fallen in within the private domain, reproductive autonomy, and, and the recognition of it as a constitutional right, right? Now, I'm not going to tell you about the potential and shortcomings of Roe v. Wade, you know, particularly its, its privacy um, limited lens. Um, you know, it's still very much it's a private matter rather than it's a con social reproduction and therefore collective endeavor. But still, you know, in the in the story of history or her story of constitutionalism, it, it is this uh, really far out uh, thing. In Europe, um, it's very interesting because at the same time Roe uh, was um, decided, you can identify several European countries, Austria, France, Italy, that come up with constitutional abortion decisions. So really, this is the moment in which ab the abortion debate is historically constitutionalized. But what we see in Europe, in contrast, is two things. One is courts saying, the constitutions don't talk about this, sorry, this is for the legislature to decide. Um, and the other thing is to actually say, as the German abortion decision, which is probably the more fa the most famous one of this time, says, well, actually, you know, what is the constitutional status of a fetus? And it constructs the whole debate around the question of the constitutional status of fetus and comes up with this notion that the fetus deserves some constitutional protection, um, either you know through criminal means or through other equally effective means. Uh, there may be, of course, exceptions, and then you, you get to the indications, you know, health, life of the mother, rape, uh, embryopathetic um, 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 indications, but the state, but at the same time, um, the, the framing is the state has a duty to produce a reproduction-friendly society. Now, why is this an aha moment? Because, of course, as I just mentioned, you know, we have this maternalist tradition. So the idea that you, you know, that the, the, the justices, male, would start from the assumption that, you know, that the protection owed to the fetus could translate into some kind of a duty of motherhood if everything is fine, maybe in some exceptional circumstances, you can, you know, you can be exempted from that duty. At the same time, however, and this is the, the other side of the coin, um, the justices don't say, you know, it's a private matter, we don't care. No, you know, women have prima facie motherhood duty, but the community has to help. It's also a state duty. We have to, you know, fight against discrimination that um, women encounter, um, make sure that uh, women wanting to have children, but who cannot for lack of means, you know, find assistance. So this is how it starts. Now, this has now changed gradually in uh, Europe. Um, and what you see is in what I called in the book, new abortion constitutionalism, really happening very much um, in the new millennium. And what we see is that the courts, you know, of course, many countries are proceeding, have proceeded legislatively, but what happens to those countries like Germany or those who inherited, you know, because there's a huge tradition to inherit German doctrine. So my own country, Spain, took from German, Germany, then Portugal took from Spain, then, you know, that was exported to Latin American Catholic countries. So that seed of European constitutionalism actually has traveled quite widely. And what you see happening there is not the giving up of the notion that the unborn or the fetus deserves some degree of constitutional protection, but the notion that 
well, first of all, the fetus is not a rights holder. So, you know, it isn't really as a right holder that you can claim that protection, but that, you know, unborn life is still human life and deserves some, you know, respect, some dignity um, in the way we approach it. So basically we kind of banalize abortion. It cannot just be any other, you know, like any other um, um, means to, to avoid unwanted pregnancies. But what you see is, is, is first of all, uh, decisions that start foregrounding women's reproductive autonomy much more. You know, that was kind of very much in the background in the 70s, much less so. And secondly, you start saying, well, the only form of protecting unborn life is not just, a, you know, it's not just through, through punishment, through criminal punishment. That is kind of a carceral form of, of protection. There are many other forms, and the most effective forms are, are forms that actually help women make those decisions by giving the means, by preventing unwanted pregnancies. So yes, there is still a constitutional mandate of protection, but it, it is gets articulated in, in later stages of the pregnancy in this objective rather than subjective rights form. Um, and that is also happening in, in, has also happened in a slower path in Latin America. You, you still, you see a region where the full ban was the norm and then courts saying, well, you have to at least have some exceptions and now gradually, you know, getting to idea that maybe there's, you know, women should have a first, you know, a, 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 in, in the early phases of pregnancy, a constitutional claim to decide whether to carry on with their pregnancies or not. So there's this really lively debate. I mean, think of Ireland. It's, it's not just being a constitutional interpretation. There's been also amendments. You know, the Irish constitution was amend, uh, amended to allow for a legislation that could... Um, um, legalize abortion. There's a fascinating ongoing debate in France as to whether the right to abortion is going to be entrenched in the constitution uh, that is now in front of the European, of the French parliament. So there's there's that, um, you know, while Colombia and Argentina have recently, you know, celebrated. So you see that where that part of the world that started from the protection of the fetus is, is, is going through that evolution of more, um, you know, reproductive autonomy to women and other forms, more collective forms, so to say, a protection to unborn life. You kind of see this this regression in the U.S. going in the in the opposite um, in the opposite direction. Unfortunately, although I'm sure with a lot of contestation and state action reacting to that, I mean, these things are not are not static. But yes, it's it's kind of striking to see that you know, the U.S. was kind of leading in some ways. And now, you know, it's kind of like, and also this idea that Roe falls and then, you know, there's this black hole. It was, you know, if you look at Europe, you can say, even if you don't recognize that there is a constitutional right to have an abortion, as many other countries have not recognized, there's still lots of things that you can argue to, you know, not uh, fall in that black hole where, you know, Total bans are 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 you know arguably now constitutionally okay. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I wanted to turn to actually another subject uh, where the United States uh, has unfortunately an exceptional status, right? Which is the area of gender quotas. Mm -hmm. So your book describes really a global trend towards uh, legislative gender quotas, so as to ensure the equal representation of women in government. This trend does not apply to the United States, so. That's something that I have gone around and around on with colleagues. Like, why is this? And would you say that the op opposition here is primarily cultural or related to the U.S. constitutional architecture that we were discussing or some combination of the two? Mm. No, yeah, indeed. Um, you know, more than 85 countries have now these gender quotas. They actually appeared for the first time. I want to give Asia credit. Mm. Uh, they appeared for the first time in, in, in Asia. Um, though at the time um, they were linked to colonial dynamics, they also included ethnic minorities, rural populations. It's really in the 90s when I when I mentioned that participatory moment, that you know parity, this idea of parity of gender balance representation is you know more and more put to the fore. It's a very compelling idea. The idea is basically that democracy is being redefined 
but now you know in in the eyes of many people you, you if you don't have equal representation you simply can't claim that there's a democratic legitimacy so it's it's, it's a really you know it touches on uh, on the on the structure of powers and not just you know a fundamental rights claim so it's it's a pretty ambitious vision um it starts with the threshold quotas and now in many in many parts it's become parody it's been as you said embedded in constitutions um in ecuador for instance it, it applies to all three branches not just to the legislative nepal has also lots of executive and legislative quotas in the constitution so it's not just europe um interestingly interestingly in europe because constitutions were older um, some constitutional amendments were necessary before quotas could be passed. It's in more, it's in the new constitutionalism, the constitutionalism that's written after um, it, at the end of the last century and the uh, in the beginning of this century that you have now provisions that enable this agenda. So constitutions are not seen as stumbling blocks as in old constitutionalism, but as enabling provisions, right? This is, you know, a, a big difference between the old and the new constitutionalism. Now the problem with with the U.S. constitutionalism, which is the oldest among the old constitutionalism, is that that you know, as you said, constitutionals are so difficult. It's it's an old constitution, but old constitutions are also so difficult to amend. But I think you're right to su to suggest and imply that it's it's a bit of a conundrum. Um, so I'm not sure that if constitutions were easier to be amended, you would naturally have gender quotas adopted in the US. And I have a whole piece written where I struggle with this. And I use that piece when I teach uh, comparative law because precisely of the way you framed your question, the difficulty of disentangling when it comes to you know, comparing, is it really the problem of the law? Is it something bigger that has to do with the culture, a combination of, that, of both that we could call constitutional culture? What is it? And um, you know, so I only have, you know, kind of intuitions and guesses about why. And, and many of these intuitions I've built uh, when, I, when, I, when I've given talks in the U.S. about parity and, and parity democracy and what's happening in Europe and in Latin America. And I see the reaction of the, of the audience. Um, and, and so I think it's a combination of things. I think the, the, the fact that we have a that we still have a prevalent formal equality understanding with a focus on anti-stereotyping uh, makes, um, uh, you know, makes um, the idea of quotas, you know, just a little bit uncomfortable. I mean, you only have to look at, you know, the equal protection clause and, and the difficulty of, of, you know, any form of affirmative action. You know, in fact, as we speak, we're seeing that getting narrower and narrower. Um, it, and linked to that, I think given the US uh, problematic racial past, you know, every time I talk about gender quotas, because re remember the, the global trend is specifically around gender quotas. And every time I present on this, I get the question from the audience. So what about racial quotas? What about the racial contract? Right, because I, 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 you know, I, I appeal to the sexual contract that we need to overcome through this understanding of parity. So I think the very problematic and constitutionally, you know, embedded racial past of of the U.S. makes it very difficult to have one agenda flow without the other agenda. And of course, the idea that you would have both racial and gender quotas being adopted uh, makes it also very uh, difficult to imagine. I also think it's it's a you know there's a much larger faith in the in the US about you know about meritocracy you know as it is expressed through the free functioning of the market and civil society including political parties which are arguably protected by first amendment I think we have a less um, you know I think we have a, a more um, modest belief in meritocracy in other parts of the world where we recognize the structural disadvantage and in, in structural discrimination is, is the starting position and not, uh, you know, um, equality and freedom and equal opportunities. And so we see these remedies 
as necessary as embodiments of equality. I mean, think of the fact that even affirmative action in the US has to be justified in the name of diversity, not simply you know, injustice, right? Structural discrimination. That's what we're trying to remedy. No, you know, it's an exception to the notion of equality, not a fulfillment thereof. And it's um, and it has to be justified on uh, in the name of the benefits that the entire society or student body derives. It's radically different from saying no. You know, we start from a structural disadvantage and, and discrimination position, and remedying that is fulfilling equality, not making it exceptional. So I think it's it, it brings you know it's by bringing all those elements together. I think that that uh, one can try to start explaining why it's not happening. But I'm willing to be convinced otherwise if someone has the <laughs> answer to what why this is happening. I do think that you're exactly right. That you know this allergy to racial quotas is what's driving a similar kind of unquestioning allergy to gender quotas uh, here in the U.S. But um, I, I defer to you and your greater kind of uh, thought, your deeper thought on this, but I'm glad to hear you say it. So I now like to, you know, talk to something that, you know, is near and dear to my heart, right, which is uh, the effect of gender constitutionalism and LGBTQ plus rights. So I found this book incredibly instructive on these fronts. So I was just wondering if you could share uh, with our audience and start, you know, and anywhere you want, you know, it can be mm -hmm. um, same-sex marriage, it can be uh, what you write about with regard to a growing constitutionalism around the claims of trans and intersex persons, right, with constitutions weighing in on both sides, right, of that mm. equation. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit about how gender constitutionalism has affected the LGBT yeah. plus community? Yeah, well, you know, in a way, what's interesting when you put all these pieces together is that you see that there's a natural, you know, there's a natural sequence. And of course, the fact that, you know, gender stereotypes and that the gender, con the sexual contract comes to be more and more challenged eventually also leads to the question of um you know for instance same sex marriage right i mean it's 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 linked to that now don't get me wrong just like with you know say quotas in europe you know um constitutions were first a stumbling block um precisely because the idea that you know family based on heterosexual reproductive marriage was the foundation of society and so many constitutions refer to marriage as a as an as an institution they refer to the family as the cell of society so what you see is that the agenda has proceeded legislatively and that when when the courts and you know this better than I do but uh, and I and I draw and I cite you in my book but when the courts first are confronted with this question, they will say, either defer to the legislature, this is not for us to decide, or in fact, you know, say no, you know, the institution of marriage was is, is a heterosexual institution, and whether it's explicitly spelled out or not, that was always the understanding of the of the Constitution. So, um, so so there is there is that, and it takes quite a bit of time to start seeing the first courts that appeal to either equality or dignity or liberty as requiring marriage equality. I think Hawaii was was probably the first one in ninety three, and it took many years. I think that Fury decision in South Africa came in two thousand and five, and Obergefell in in two thousand and fifteen. There's a a, 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 a Colombian decision that follows th that in 2016, Taiwan 2017. So it's very recent and rather exceptional that courts will step in to actually say it is a constitutional right. Interestingly, when they do so, they don't necessarily refer all that much or so much to the wording um, of the of the provisions but much more to the interpretation of what the ultimate purpose of the institution is. And this is how you see the connection between the dismantling of the sexual contract, which is, you know, one division of labor, really very much organized around, you know, reproduction and, you know, reproductive roles for women. And what you see is courts suddenly saying, well, marriage is not necessarily about you know reproduction, it's about companionship, it's about solidarity, responsibilities, uh, care, 
And that's what allows that uh, progression. Now, that, you know, that said, and not unlike what happened in the US after that first decision, when you go to whoa, all that movement, what you see, unfortunately, in the, in the last years, I would say in the last 10, 15 years, is that many constitutions are being amended to prevent uh, same-sex marriage. I mean, just in Central and Eastern Europe, over the last 15 years, you have eight constitutions that have been amended to make sure and render very explicit that marriage is heterosexual marriage. And unfortunately, it's not just limited to, um, to that part of the, uh, the world. You, you, you know, it's not just Hungary, Poland, Croatia, Latvia. It's also Honduras in Latin America, many African countries. So there is what one could call, you know, not a backlash because many of these countries haven't had it yet, but a kind of a preemptive strike to avoid, you know, the isomorphism and the contagion effect. So as you said, it's not stable and, you know, that would apply um, to a large extent also to what you see in the trans uh, domain, where you see some courts, again, to the extent that there is progress, it's mostly legislation, only some courts are, um, you know, helping that process either by saying that gender reclassification has to be an, a possibility constitutionally, or by you know challenging some of the requirements that have been traditionally asked for people wanting to um, undergo transition. Only, only very few courts that embrace as a matter of constitutional right, self-determination or moving beyond the binary with Asian jurisdictions leading the way when it comes to the third genders, which has a interesting historical and cultural background, as you know. But there again, you know, some, some preemptive strikes and Hungary, uh, you know, uh, reformed its constitution a couple of years ago to, you know, say that dad is a man and mom is a woman. It literally says so. So all these things are unstable. But what I find interesting is that so, you know, that many of these battles are actually playing out constitutionally. The constitutionalism plays a significant role in many of these countries when it comes to addressing these, these battles. Yeah, you know, as I'm sure is evident to everyone uh, just listening to you, you're such a urbane, uh, cosmopolitan and sophisticated, you know, interlocutor. We've traveled from, you know, Colombia to Nepal to Portugal and, to, you know, all over the world, really. So I'm a little bit abashed to ask this very uh, simple question, um, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Right. So in traveling, you know, across all these jurisdictions, were there any national constitutions that jumped out at you as best in class and issues of gender? Do you look at one of them and say, you know, this is the gender utopia of transformative constitutionalism or this is a paradise thinly disguised? Well, it, you know, the, the answer is a bit of a sad answer because I was going to say Chile, Chile. Um, now, you know, the Chile um, exemplify something that will remain for the history of constitutionalism, which is the first ever fully paritary constitutional assembly, you know, coming up with a text um, and also bypassing political parties. So really civil society engagement, you know, there were housewives <laughs> participating in the constitutional assembly. And they came up with a text that in many ways uh, looked like a, a dream, which as we know, unfortunately, has not been ratified in referendum in part because it was presented as a package and it's kind of hard to get the hold of you know, people to agree on um, 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 a certain text. There, there was also, there were also really evil misinformation campaigns and probably some naivete in the terms of how much you can overcome de facto and, and economic and political powers uh, in a society that was still clinging on to the dictatorial um, Pinochet constitution, however uh, amended it had been. But I still think it's worth uh, you know, looking at the text that was approved. It has a gender inclusive language, which makes very much sense in Spanish where you know, where the genders are declined much more often in the use of the words. It, 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 it conceptualizes as a fundamental right, the right to care, understood as the right to care, to be taken care of, and to self-care. I mean, that in a constitution is striking. 
the right to life free of violence. Uh, it conceptualizes not only reproductive rights very explicitly, but sexual rights. So sexual rights as, as rights, um, the right to sexual education as a fundamental right, uh, parity in the composition of all state powers and very, very prolific um, um, provisions when it comes to what it calls um, diversidades y desidencias sexuales, so sexual diversities and dissidences, uh, which I, which is also a term I, I kind of like, um, you know, talking about substantive equality, effective representation, life free of violence and discrimination, um, as well as, you know, the, you know, suspect grounds for classification, including sexual characteristics, sexual orientation, sexual identities, uh, gender expression. So I still think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a text worth um, looking at. But what I want to say is that, you know, there's always caveats. In this case, you know, this text wasn't approved. But other, other you know, breakthrough constitutions like the South African constitution in 94, it was a breakthrough for gender constitutionalism. And, you know, that was approved. But, you know, what you find is that not every constitution you know, performs equally well in every domain. Nepal is a fascinating example because it has a, 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 a long provision of women's rights um, and, and, you know, very, again, very uh, sophisticated and rich, but that it contains some explicit, you know, discrimination in terms of citizenship inheritance because of nationalism issues. So often you find that there are contradictions there's also often a big tension between law in the books and law in action. And people will say, oh, yeah, you mentioned Ecuador. And yes, it's wonderful that Ecuador has a, a duty to care. It's not just a right. It's a duty. You have to pay your taxes. You have to be law abiding. You may be asked to serve in the military and you have to care. It's a constitutional duty. And the Ecuadorian constitution also recognizes that there has to be social provision and we have to challenge the division between productive and reproductive work. Uh, but then people say, yeah, but, but you know, how applied is that constitution? Well, you know, there are some interesting cases on the right to care um, in um, being put forward by the constitutional court. And yes, it's true that constitutions don't have the same normative force, that they don't act as black letter law in, in the same way in every part of the world. But I still think that constitutions fulfill a very important symbolic and expressive role, and also that they can be the catalyst for mobilization and civil society engagement. And they, you know, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't throw all of that out of the window just because there are contradictions or because there's a gap between law in the books and law in action, which there's anyways, right? Um, so maybe look at Chile, but, you know, you could also look at, you know, Bolivia, Ecuador, to some extent, South Africa, as I said, I would say any constitution that was crafted after the 90s with uh, important civil society and women's and Sogi rights um, engagement is, is likely to have inspiring uh, provisions. And then for the case law, you have to look a bit more closely to identify patterns. Thank you. So we're going to do uh, Q and A organically. If you have any questions, uh, audience, that you want uh, Professor Rubio Marin to answer, please put them in the Q and A function, uh, not in the chat, but in the Q and A. Um, and I'll just keep going. So we're now living through a time of tremendous backlash against so-called gender ideology and an attempt to restore traditionalist ideas about gender and sexuality. Mm. So what role does constitutionalism play in navigating this cultural and political backlash? A, a very big role, Kenji, a very big role, because what you see is the strange alliances between, you know, religious groups and just populist nationalist groups that are not particularly religious, but are aligning. And what you find is that, you know, human rights and democracy as, as narratives are being co-opted and are being offered as, um, you know, are being examine and exploited in ways that offer a secular language to combat basically the disestablishment of gender roles. Um, 
And, and what I try to do in the book is I actually try to, to name some of the strategies, some of the constitutional strategies that, that are being, that we see being displayed. So I already mentioned a constitutional entrenchment. So, you know, simply modify your constitution, say mom is, mom is, is a woman and dad is a, is, is a man or, you know, when I say marriage, I mean heterosexual marriage, and we see plenty of that. You also see, you also see DOPS, you also see the erosion technique, you know, so where you have not been able to amend the constitution the way you wanted, you gradually and pretty much through court packing get to a jurisprudential outlawing of precedent. Um, so there goes Roe um, and, and, and Casey, but also Poland, same thing, you know, there was a legislation, legislative attempt, massive demonstrations, bill gets pulled back, and eventually the constitutional court resolves it in a very unsatisfactory way. I also refer to what I call preemption, and this this, this idea that the constitutional uh, identity of a country has to prevail even over um, international norms, even when the country has ratified them. And I exemplify that with a very vivid uh, constitutional uh, conversation happening mostly in Central and Eastern Europe um, and um, Central Asia, where you see the Istanbul Convention which is the European Convention to Combat Violence Against Women, being suddenly either not ratified or even, you know, unilateral withdrawal um, on the grounds that it challenges the constitutional identity of these countries and say, well, so, how so? And that's because it contains a, a provision, Article 3, that refers to gender as a social construct. So suddenly you see these countries you know, denouncing a, a, a treaty that's there to protect women against the violence they still unfortunately experience because, um, you know, because, no, because gender is not a social construct and our constitution actually talks about women. It talks about mothers. It says we have to protect the mothers. So there you go. We have the sexual binary in the constitution. I mean, this sounds kind of uh, foolish, but it's, you know, it's part of the reasoning of a Bulgarian constitutional court decision. And then finally, there's co-option. So there's this really co-option of democracy and fundamental rights to turn them, you know, over their head and say, okay, you know, you know, gay people and trans people and women have gotten all these rights. Well, guess what? I'm going to exercise civil disobedience or I'm going to apply to my, you know, conscientious objections. So um, you know, I want to be, I am, the majority is now presented as the victim um, of indoctrination by this woke culture, and suddenly exemptions are being asked not to protect minorities, but to circumvent the recognition of these rights. So no cake for you and your same-sex wedding, no assistance to abortion, even if you're just, you know, the nurse or even the person selling the stuff. No taking my children to your gender theory or sexual education class, right? And this is the US, but this is also Brazil. I mean, it, it, all these trends, actually, it seems that they get together, they look at what's happening elsewhere, and then they copy paste. But now this is all being done, and not even in the name of God, but just simply, you know, talking a secular language of rights, democracy, constitutional identity. So it's, you know, it's, 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 it's scary. But probably not that surprising. I mean, if the whole hypothesis of the book is that there was something really structural and foundational, if that has gotten, you know, turn on its head, should we expect that without any revolt and without any rebellion? You know, probably, probably not. We're starting to get some questions from the audience, and I'm going to pair um, two of them, uh, which both have to do with kind of supranational um, kind of enforcement of gender equality. So the first question is, DAWs might not be the U.S. exception in Europe with the Polish Constitutional Tribunal decision, decision in 2020 that you referenced, right? And the Italian conscientious objection issues. Are there EU-wide instruments to preventing more DAWs-type constitutional rulings in Europe? And then similarly, you know, what, if any, role has international human rights law played in the constitutionalization of gender as you describe it in this four, yeah. you know, categories? So CDAW, you know, adopted in 1980, with which I'm sure you're very familiar. 
you know, yeah. uh, prohibits discrimination against women and many of the ways that you describe, you know, how has this been cashed out in constitutional orders? Yeah, well, for on the first question, um, <clears throat> now in terms of EU, the there has been there has been well first of all you have to you have to realize that the EU only has certain competences and then you know that reproductive rights is is is, is not a domain um, where the EU has a uh, jurisdiction. Um, secondly, unfortunately, some of these extreme right wing parties are Eurosceptic parties that have a significant representation of the European Parliament at the moment when we speak. I mean, you know, these countries are, all, you know, Poland and Hungary, and it, but also within uh, Spain, Italy, the, you know, France, there are, you know, voices that would support um, this re-traditionalization um, of the family. So it's not all that easy. You know, there are struggles and there are fights that are being put forward, but it's it often takes the form of some of some soft law, you know, a declaration of that sort. So it's soft power. But but again, it's not that easy because it's not an outside enemy. <laughs> if you want, it's inside. And, uh, you know, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, you know, many of these dynamics are really, really uh, taking place there. So it's not easy. Human rights, absolutely yes. Um, um, so, so what happened is that precisely in that moment that I identified as participatory constitutionalism, it also coincides with the flourishing of women's human rights. Um, and so the combination of the fact that many of these constitutional processes are more open and more open to civil society, plus the um, the fact that think of the Latin American transitions, you know, but also in you know in Africa, both international but also regional, the Maputo Protocol. So it's 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 transitioning while incorporating uh, human rights standards and looking around and seeing what other constitutions have done and how you can move it forward. It's the combination of those factors. So absolutely yes. In fact. In some countries, and in, uh, in Latin America, for instance, there's the notion of constitutional block, where the constitutional parameter is not just the constitution, but the constitution together with the body of human rights that the country has adopted. And in the sense, it, you know, in meaning that they have to be jointly interpreted and applied. So absolutely, yes. Wonderful. Uh, the next question is, uh, and I, I'm afraid this will have to be our last one, but comes in in a much higher, kind of more abstract, I should say, register. So looking back to origins, how big of a role do you think religion plays in the establishment of patriarchy in societies and in the law? Oh, <laughs> I think, it, you know, I think it plays a very, very big role. Um, you know, when you, I was talking about this abortion constitutionalism in Europe, it, it really is, you know, it really is, you know, Christian and it's Catholic, you know, it's, 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 so it often just shows in the fact that the majority is of a certain belief, but it also shows, and I haven't, you know, we haven't discussed that because we don't have time to discuss the entire book, but there is a section in which I address, for instance, a situation of legal pluralism where secular law uh, coexists with religious law. And really, when you look at the domains of religious law, it's often precisely, you know, the family, it's, 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 it's reproduction, it's marriage. It's, it's so, so the religious accommodation of, you know, the, the, the accommodation of religious pluralism often performs a second order family exceptionalism. So there was already a family exceptionalism in the in the in the embedding of the of the constitutional order, saying, well, the family has its own internal logic and equality doesn't quite apply in here. And then on top of that, you have you know the situations of legal pluralism, which often kind of delegate precisely those domains, acting as a way of you know multiplying family exceptionalism. So I think it plays a, a really fundamental role. And of course, you know, I just mentioned in, in the backlash, um, these, these alliances, you know, the 90s is the moment 
in which you know women's rights become foregrounded and that's exactly the moment where the vatican church but also um the islamic churches uh, start creating the narrative to counter that those evolutions and challenge what they you know put together in a box called gender ideology. So unfortunately, a very important and dominant role. Wonderful. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time uh, today, Ruth, but I just wanna hold up this book. Uh, so, and thank you for this beautiful, beautiful um, conversation and this extraordinary work. Uh, the breadth and depth of your knowledge is absolutely dazzling as I find every time, my friend. Uh, thank you so much for our conversation today. Thank you, Kenji, for the opportunity and thank you to everyone for listening. We're adjourned. Have a wonderful day, everybody.